Africa is already taking steps to become less reliant on the West. This in the wake of the 15th BRICS summit, which took place in Santon last week. Members of BRICS, including recently admitted Ethiopia and Egypt, pledged to work with the business community on preventing, preparing for and responding to pandemics in a historic discussion hosted by the South African Health Department and other organizations. Let's bring in BRICS Business Council member Dr. Stavros Nikolaou for more. Doctor, thank you so much uh, for speaking to us here on Newsnight this evening. Can you tell us what is 3P2R and what does it mean for BRICS and for the AU? Firstly, good evening and thanks very much for having me on. Uh, triple P double R is not a chemical formula. It stands for pandemic prevention, preparedness and recovery. Now, the reason we had this uh, side event on the margins of the of the BRIC summit, because people were kind of saying but the, the BRIC summit is largely about the economy and business mm. and I, I think there's a very simple reason for that i think we all saw the consequences of being ill prepared the vast inequalities in healthcare systems the vast inequity that existed in acquiring vaccines and other medical countermeasures we saw the impact of that on the african continent it was the most manifest and arguably many parts of the African continent, including our own country here, South Africa, are still, are still struggling to recover economically to the levels we were pre-pandemic. So this discussion of being, well, firstly of preventing and then being prepared uh, when the next pandemic hits and uh, it's, it's not a when or an if, we, we will get other pandemics that do come around um, fairly frequently and I think the issue here is that when you are struck with the next pandemic uh, regardless of the size of the pandemic that you're able to respond appropriately right now the African continent is is ill prepared for any future pandemic and arguably we're in a pre-pandemic phase we shouldn't look at this as waiting for the next pandemic. You've got to have a mindset that says we are pre-pandemic at the moment and let us be ready when that day strikes. And this is what uh, this uh, side event was about. Um, it's completely interrelated and interfaces with business, with the economy, because if you cannot respond appropriately to a pandemic, the, the economic fallouts are significant and we saw lives and livelihoods being lost when they could have been saved during the pandemic. Mm. So this is all about how do we respond in the present where we uh, are not faced with the pandemic but could be faced with one and what are the appropriate collaborative measures that we take in order to mitigate and soften any future pandemics and not have the type of loss of lives and livelihoods unnecessarily so that we experienced during the last pandemic. So part of the collaborate effort was in identifying the existing capabilities and acknowledging the gaps that would need to be closed for adequate pandemic preparation and response. What are some of the gaps that were raised in this meeting? Look, there, there are many gaps, so let me focus on, on three. I think the first is the, the 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 thing that is most effective in preventing disease other than clean running water of course is is vaccines or are vaccines i should say um now the vaccines have got a, a tried and tested record over many centuries more than two centuries and we've seen the impact on reducing both mortality and morbidity with the pediatric vaccines, uh, the so-called EPR program that we cover in this country and uh, in most countries around the world. Uh, and the first gap is that at a moment of crisis, the whole world becomes insular. So everyone talks about solidarity, but in the hour of need, they turn their back on you. We, we saw India shutting its borders to the export of vaccines. Some parts of Europe did the same. Or at very least, we saw hoarding of vaccines in Europe and countries like Canada. So the first gap is we don't have appropriate capacity and capability on the continent. Uh, we, we've got this in fragments.
and we need to develop that further so that we are not reliant on anyone in the future if we need to acquire and administer vaccines. So that, that's the first gap. The, the second gap um, is around what we call medical countermeasures. So this could be medical diagnostics, it could be test kits. Um, you know, for the first three months of the of the COVID pandemic, we couldn't get enough tests to get testing going in our country. So building countermeasure, medical countermeasure capability and capacity, whether it's in the form of test, uh, test kits, diagnostics, or, or medicines that are required for treatment is another gap that needs to be plugged. And then I think the third gap, of course, speaks to the strength of healthcare systems on the continent. Now, we, we know that we have weak healthcare systems um, uh, further exacerbated by these vast geographies, uh, very often lack of, of human capital, uh, lack of digitalization. So these are all gaps that need to be plugged, just the digitalization gap alone. I mean, if you're able to, to interlink things, the time you can save for the scarce resource being doctors, nurses, and pharmacists is immense. So those are just three of the challenges mm. that need to be addressed in, in the here and now so that for the future, we are not caught in the same situation we were. And as I keep saying, lives and livelihoods were unnecessarily lost and we still live with the remnants of what went on two and a half or three years ago. Mm. I think it's significant to mention that the expanded BRICS family now represents 4.8 billion people, which is over half the global population. So that makes this effort not only vital for countries uh, that, as you say, in the COVID pandemic experienced unequal access to not only vaccines, but to healthcare in general. It also then has serious implications for global health, right? It, it, it does. You know, you can never have uh, global peace and security and I, I think a lot of the discussions um, were uh, and uh, you know today I attended Ukrainian National Day and um, the, the the South African government representative said you know we've got to try and find peace at all costs now you can never hope to have global safety peace and security unless you have health security you know pe people uh, are going to migrate if they don't get appropriate or, or proper healthcare services. South Africa case in point, a, a number of um, patients from neighboring and surrounding countries land up being treated in, in South African facilities because there is no health security. Similarly, many migrants travel from, uh, you know, as far afield as, as Central Africa, North Africa in, into Europe and that's because people can't access, amongst other things, suitable and appropriate health care. And you've got this in, inequitable health care. So achieving health security is, is not just a South African or an African issue. It's very much a global issue. And I think the, the, the event that I'm referring to held last Thursday on the margins of, of the BRICS, the 15th BRICS Summit, uh, was very much about collaborative efforts to establish a framework, and these frameworks are what you can roll out at the time of a pandemic. And it's it's precisely that, uh, you know, the, the, these difficult conversations that we need to begin aligning, converging and coalescing on. Talk to us briefly about the funding for these uh, preventative preparation response um, uh, and recovery measures that are being proposed. You know, I could easily have put, and it did cross my mind, to put funding and, and access to capital as, as, as the fourth challenge. Um, I, I held back because we have seen that in the time of, of crises, like we experienced with HIV on our very own continent, and I think it's well recorded that 68% of the world's HIV population resides in Africa. Um, we, we saw at the time uh, the establishment or the emergence of the Global Fund, for example, UNITAID, PEPFAR, which is uh, the, the American President's Emergency Relief Fund for AIDS. We, we saw all of these initiatives, including World Bank and IMF, becoming involved in the funding. Now, there has been some 
fragments, I would call it, of, of funding that is being made made available. I, I think CEPI, which is a, a global coalition for prevention of pandemics, that CEPI, I think they've done a fairly good job um, around making some funding available, but uh, we're not seeing the level of funding that we saw um, during the emergence of HIV and AIDS. So we, we do need to step up a few gears to certainly to get to that level where we've got appropriate funding so that you can deal not only with pandemic preparedness, but also other um, future pandemics, uh, namely non-communicable diseases. Right now, we're starting to see a significant emergence of, of cancers, of diabetes, on the African continent. So we were previously a continent that was um, held out or called out for infectious diseases, but now we're seeing the non-infectious diseases, what we call NCDs, non-communicable diseases, coming to the fore. And uh, regrettably, there is very little or no funding to deal with those crises. And those crises, those public health crises, all impact significantly on the fiscus, on, on productivity and on economies. Well, the first step is uh, collaborative efforts and uh, countries and regions holding each other to account. Uh, so thank you for giving us uh, a rundown of what took place at that meeting. That was BRICS Business Council member Dr. Stavros Nikolaou.